The big day is almost upon us. In less than 10 hours' time, polling stations will be open in 650 constituencies across the United Kingdom to select a new House of Commons, the lower House of Parliament. The election campaign has been by any measure intense, entertaining, and fascinating, even if quite short by American standards. You see, even though there hasn't been a parliamentary election for more than five years, this election was called only four weeks ago. I suppose it's up to me to set this historic election in some kind of context for our, our American audience, and I see some of my students from my American culture class here, so perhaps I'm aiming this at you. Um, the governing Labour Party, led by incumbent Prime Minister Gordon Brown, will be looking to secure a fourth consecutive term in office and to restore support lost since its huge victory in 1997. The Tories, or Conservative Party, under the leadership of David Cameron, will seek to gain a dominant position in UK politics after their losses in the 90s and to replace Labour as the governing party. Nick Clegg's Liberal Democrats, or as they're almost always called, Lib Dems, hope to make gains from both sides. Their most realistic ambition as the campaign began four weeks ago was to hold the balance of power in what's called a hung parliament. That's a parliament where no party has uh, a majority. Yet since the American-style televised debates between the three leaders began just over two weeks ago, Clegg mania has shaken up the race, and Lib Dem's poll ratings rose to the point where many are considering the possibility of a liberal Democrat role in government. Despite our political affiliations, Dole Institute uh, our differing political affiliations, Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey, who will be conducting the interview of our two guests, and I have many things in common. One is that we're both political junkies who know just enough about British politics to be dangerous. <laughs> we knew that despite the time in the semester and the beautiful weather, we simply had to put, to put on a public program about this important political moment in the UK. To help us understand things across the pond, we have two British-born guests, my colleague Victor Bailey on the end, is known to many of you as the outstanding director of the Hall Center for the Humanities where he's served since 2000. He's also the Charles W. Batty Distinguished Professor of Modern British History at KU. And his research interests include the history of criminal justice and criminal law in Britain. His most recent research project is a history of punishment in England. He should be done with that in about 30 years. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, he has received a Kemper Fellowship for Teaching Excellence and the Walter D. Love Prize from the North American Conference on British Studies. Professor Bailey has degrees from Oxford and Cambridge Universities and the Center for the Study of Social History at Warwick University, where he studied with the legendary E.P. Thompson. Before coming to the United States, Jeremy Taylor, in the middle, helped train Lib Dem candidates for parliament in communications and leadership skills. He worked very closely with party leaders Charles Kennedy and leaders of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland. He was also briefly a candidate for office himself, giving our panel a bit of on-the-ground expertise as an approved parliamentary candidate, a designation that reflects significant investments of time and work. He also worked for the Lib Dems in fundraising, communications, conference organizing, and public affairs. Mr. Taylor moved to Lawrence in 2004. He is both a real estate agent and the host of The Jeremy Taylor Show on KLWN Radio 1320. Um, I've been lucky enough to be a guest on that show, and he makes you feel very welcome, and I enjoy listening to it as well. Please join me in welcoming our panel of British election experts to the Dole Institute. Thank you all for joining us today. And one, uh, one additional announcement. If you enjoyed the tea or a scone and you have any glassware, please take it over to the table over there that covered by the tablecloth because catering doesn't clean that up. So if you don't help us by doing that, we can't do something like that again. So please do that. Gentlemen, one of you has practical experience in British politics. One is a historian. Uh, kind of both of you go through, and Jeremy, we'll start with you first this time. Kind of go through your experiences in uh, British politics. My experience with British politics started when um, the organizer of the local constituency, who was a lovely old lady who had managed to escape from a concentration camp, said to me, uh, Jeremy, you wouldn't want to be a councillor, would you? And that was on the Wednesday lunchtime, and by Friday I was standing as a, as a local councillor. And um, I didn't win that election, but we have by-elections, which is something you don't have here. And uh, six months later I, I found myself, I got myself elected, and I was hooked. My brother had been involved with the early parts of the Liberal Democrats, um, which was a split from the traditional Labour Party. Um, anyway, you know, I did that. I then went on to become an approved candidate, and we can talk more about what that means later. 
um, which meant that I was entitled to stand in a constituency if that constituency wanted me to stand for them. Um, and I looked at a number of different constituencies and in fact if I wasn't sitting here and hadn't married my American wife I would be currently in England um, chewing my nails because it's about half past nine now we'd be waiting for the election tomorrow <coughs> and uh, I have lots of friends who are chewing their nails right now as so does my wife and uh, that's basically it. Would it be safe to say, and let me follow up and then uh, ask Victor to answer the same question, but is it safe to say that you were, in, in terms of training people in politics, you were kind of a liberal, democratic, political operative, using the language we'd use here in the U.S.? Yeah, I was listening to, we, we just mentioned West Wing. Um, I, I would be a sort of a cross between Josh and Toby. Uh, my job was to um, stand slightly behind the candidate and make sure that what they were saying made sense to the general public. Uh, you'd have the, um, uh, the, the, the policy uh, wonks would come up with the speech that they would like the candidate to make. And of course, that speech had to be translated into English so that everybody could actually understand what was going on. And that was my job. My job was to make sure that, you know, talking to the cameras and train them to have a look at the cameras and how to, how to perform to a camera. Uh, you've seen, some of you who will have watched Nick Clegg performing, and I should add, FYI, I am a Liberal Democrat. I'm the real thing. I even have the badge uh, and the manifesto with me, in case anyone wants to ask. It's about being able to perform, and that's where Gordon Brown has messed up so much in this election. Okay, Victor? Well, my answer is very brief. I, I have no uh, political experience of uh, being actively uh, involved in the electoral system, uh, apart from being one of those people who uh, goes out uh, canvassing, trying to get people to uh, say they will support your party, and then on the day of the election, uh, getting into a car and driving around and uh, getting them to the polling station, especially if it's wet, and hoping to God they'll vote the way that they say they will vote. <laughs> um, um, I think I, I, I've taken an interest in, in the British system, I think a little bit more probably from an earlier uh, stage of life, simply because um, I came from a town uh, called Keithley, which is a textile town in the West Riding of Yorkshire. And it has the merit of being a bellwether uh, election, which is whichever way... Uh, the government of the day goes, Keithley goes. So if the Conservatives get into power, Keithley will elect a Conservative MP and vice versa. So it's a bellwether uh, constituency uh, and therefore we had polling people coming through all the time um, trying to see the way the electorate uh, was going. Uh, I then spent a lot of years in uh, Kingston-upon-Hull, which is in East Yorkshire, which is the most heavily Labour town you could wish for, at least the constituency uh, I was living in. It's one of those places where you know, 32,000 voters, uh, 31,900 vote Labour, um, and then they go looking for the 100 who didn't. <laughs> but uh, really my experience is more as historian, uh, as observer, and uh, as analyst historically. Okay. Obviously, the British system is a lot different from the U.S. system. Can uh, each of you kind of describe what you see as the principal differences, having, you know, lived in both countries? Go first. Okay. Um, well, I, just picking on a couple, I think, that, that stand out for me. Uh, one, of course, is that we don't take, we don't have an election campaign that lasts 22 years. Um, <laughs> And that's a short one. <laughs> it, it's, it's just staggering to see how long you take uh, to do your election in this country. Uh, as John or Bill said, three or four weeks in England and it's all over. And usually by the third week, people are saying, oh, I wish this got finished. It's really going on too long. <laughs> uh, so there's that aspect. It's, it's really very short and sweet, you might say, is the election campaign. Um, the second, and more seriously, is that I've always been struck by the lack of checks and balances, in a way, within the British system. If you get um, a large majority, as, say, Tony Blair did in 1997, uh, or Mrs. Thatcher did at various times, you really can push through your legislative agenda. 
there is really very little to stop you within the House of Commons uh, if the opposition party uh, clearly does not have the seats in Parliament to stop you. Uh, so I think you can actually govern very decisively and very effectively if you so wish. Um, I don't think the checks and balances in this country allow that uh, in quite the same way and therefore I think you do get this gridlock far more in this country. Uh, but if you want to, to push your agenda through in Britain and you have that majority, my goodness, you can do it. For me, I think there's a couple of points. First of all, you directly elect uh, the head of the executive, i.e. the president or the vice president. Um, and that he, at the moment, is both the head of state and leader of the government. Um, in the UK, quite clearly, the Queen is the head of state. And um, other little things like the judiciary don't have a lot to do with day-to-day. -day. You don't hear people going, talking about going to court over some something. There's two houses, so that's similar, but they are different. The House of Commons is elected, um, which is what we're talking about today. There is also the House of Lords, which is known as um, both temporal and spiritual. Temporal is us lot, and the spiritual are the bishops. Um, now, in the good old days, the House of Lords uh, was hereditary, and some of us wish it still was, but anyway, it isn't. Um, and you become a lord by being recommended. Uh, so if um, Bill was a party leader, he might say someone who'd worked very hard for the party who was retiring might suggest uh, to the Prime Minister over here, let's say, so-and-so ought to become a member of the Lords and they would become what's known as a life peer. Um, for me, the big difference is, um, is the election process and particularly um, you elect your returning officers. So here in Lawrence, it's Jamie Shue, um, who happens to be an expert on the subject, but he's a Democrat. And I can't understand how, therefore, all the Republicans think the, the thing is going to be run fairly, or vice versa. And you look around the country, you know, in Chicago was a classic example. Um, everything's going a bit, ooh, very scary, and all of a sudden there's the uh, Republican returning officer. So how can, that be, um, how can that be fair? And the big difference in the UK is that it is run, the election is run by the chief executive of the local authority, who is a civil servant, who is not elected, that's his job, that's what he does. And he will have his own personal political views. They vote early, often a week or so beforehand. Um, and the whole of the election process, the technical side of it, is run by the local, local authority, the city or the county or whoever it is. This is one of these things where, um, you know, one doesn't want to be dangerous, but uh, sort of issues they have are election fraud, um, expenses, that sort of thing. Anything that is not dealt with by the police, it's, done, uh, uh, it's looked after by an outfit called Special Branch, who are marginally more scary than if you can think of an armed IRS officer asking you questions. You know, they're very serious people. You don't mess with them. So this is something we take very seriously. But that, I can go on and on for hours, so that just briefly, I think. Just to, to talk about the kinds of issues that tend to get into the uh, elections, I think there are differences there as well between America and Britain. Uh, clearly, on the whole, race is not an issue in British politics. Uh, in fact, for until fairly recently, immigration really has not been uh, a major issue in British politics. Uh, whenever it looked as if it might rear its head, uh, and notably uh, surrounding one particular conservative politician, uh, Enoch uh, Powell, who was uh, beginning to play the race card, uh, the other, or the leadership of the main parties have closed them down very quickly indeed. And therefore immigration really has not been a major issue, I don't think, in British politics. It sounds as if it's rearing its head slightly at the moment in this election. Uh, you do hear more complaints about uh, immigration this time round than I've heard uh, before. Uh, but the big issue, I think, or bigger issue in, in British politics is really class rather than race. And uh, social class really has often divided the uh, parties uh, quite considerably. Uh, Labour, by definition, being uh, the party of the working class, you might say, 
and the conservatives more middle and upper class. The final difference I, I notice is that moral issues are not especially persuasive within the British electoral system. Um, there is never any particular debate or discussion anymore about those litmus test issues that you have in this country, uh, abortion notably. Um, those, in a sense, have been settled by legislation in the 1960s, and they have not really come back uh, to haunt the electoral system uh, since then. Uh, so, again, I think that's a big difference with the, the American context. You mentioned the issue, uh, Victor, of class. We had a, uh, a British scholar who actually specializes in domestic politics here at our archive back in February doing research on a project he's working on U.S. domestic politics. He point blank told us that in his view that American elections are better than British elections because British elections are about class and American elections are, are about ideas. Do you buy that? <laughs> Do both of um, you buy that? Just to, did you want to go, Jeremy? Yeah. I think where you look, where you see I'll do a political quote. For too long, British and American politics have both been subject to the politics of blue and red. And I think that if you're listening to Nick Clegg from the Liberal Democrats, he is saying, look, it's time for something different. Um, this isn't about class. This is about do something different. We've all heard of the phrase, if you do what you always do, you get what you always get. And I think that, yeah, there may be class, but then if I'm a Lib Dem, what am I li doing living in a big house and driving a you know, large SUV? Uh, I think it's, it's more about um, jealousy, all those things that everybody always worries about. And the fact of life is that, that um, we as animals have always tended to vote the way our parents do. We, we're blind. You know, he was talking about campaigning just now. Yes, of course we're going to vote for you. Absolutely. And you get in the booth and you vote, oh, you've always voted. Why is that? You know, but that's You're what talking happens. about in Britain. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I'm not sure it doesn't happen here. I don't think class politics are without ideas. Um, if, in fact, you look at what the two parties have stood for, um, they have had very different ideas um, over the 20th century. Uh, so the Labour Party has stood for the ideas of collectivism, uh, of state intervention, uh, of equality, of fairer distribution uh, of resources. So Labour has the ideas, and by contrast, the Conservatives, on the whole, have stood for private enterprise, uh, for shrinking the state if it's got too large, um, for uh, helping the wealthy very largely. Um, so I, I don't think that class division is without ideas. I think very much there, there are ideas. Um, all I would say finally, however, is that I think the last lot of elections um, have really just been rather dull uh, in terms of ideas because they've really essentially been about living standards, uh, whether they're rising or whether they're falling, and um, public services, whether the, the welfare state is too expensive, uh, not working, and so on. Um, but there really haven't been very many uh, new ideas within British politics, and there's certainly no vision in British politics. Um, the kind of vision, whether you like it or not, of an Obama candidate, you do not find in candidates, in my view, in British politics. Um, I, I, I must just say, I think, and I have it with me, in fact, the, the Liberal Democrats at every election I've been involved with have a, um, a policy manual and if you want to become an MP with the Liberal Democrats you have to know this policy manual backwards. Labour, very similar and they have two lists um, but as my friend says, the Tories, nobody actually knows what their policy is and again um, Cameron who's the current leader um, made an interesting comment in one of the um, uh, TV televised debates saying after the biggest recession we've ever had, we've had 13 years of labor. And he didn't realize what he'd actually said. Um, the point is that, that labor and the Liberal Democrats do have policies. You can go and look them up. You try and do that with the Tories, it's very difficult. Jeremy, you mentioned uh, the, the TV debates, which as I understand it are kind of 
new. It's kind of taking an American style of debate and using it in Britain for the first time. Is that a good thing because it gets more information to people, or is it a bad thing because it pushes the election more towards image and less towards substance? I think it shows, it, it, first of all, as an agent or, or, or the, the, the people running the campaign for the candidate, um, it's terrifying. I mean, the last person you want to put in front of a TV camera um, is Gordon Brown, who's actually a really nice guy. Um, he, he, he's, he's an accountant. You know, I don't mean that to be rude, but that's what he is. He's an accountant. He's a Scottish accountant who is virtually blind, by the way. So if you put an auto cue out there, where are they? They'd be about there. He can't read it. He can't see it. He, he has no periphery vision. So it's very, very difficult. Um, Cameron um, didn't listen to what he'd been told how to do it. Um, Clegg did somewhat and used the phrases, you know, he was talking to you out there, you know, that sort of thing. But this is the first time it's ever happened. Um, that, that they've never had a leader's televised debate. And it took a lot, of, a lot of agreeing. And a lot of the smaller parties were very angry about not being allowed to be involved in it. The Greens, the Irish parties, and so on. Um, they didn't like it at all. They moved the, they've had TV, elect, TV debates, um, and you will understand also, I should point out, there are actually three other assemblies in the UK. Uh, so it's not the, it's the UK Parliament, but there are also the other assemblies, the Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Ireland. Um, and they've been using uh, TV for them as well. But I don't know what you think, but it, it, it's given people a view of the candidate you know, instead of them w wafting up in a, in, in a big black car and, or in a helicopter or something and wafting in and a few people like this get to see the candidate and they're gone. That's it. Yeah, I think anything that um, can rejuvenate interest in politics is a good thing. And there's little doubt that these uh, televised debates have done exactly that. Uh, a large proportion of the electorate was, was watching them. Uh, and, of course, it's illustrated just what the TV can do for third parties. Uh, my God, nobody had heard of Nick Clegg four weeks ago, practically. And then suddenly, um, he is looking as if he's going to get 30% of the uh, national vote, which is astonishingly large for a, a party that, uh, throughout the, cent the 20th century, has done really rather poorly. Uh, so I think anything that actually arouses greater interest is all for the good. Um, the downside, if there is one, is clearly that I, I think the three parties ought not necessarily to hog it. I think it would have been actually quite interesting to, to have the Scottish nationalists there, Plaid Cymru from Wales. Uh, I mean, I'm even happy to have uh, screaming lots, such raving monster loony party there, actually, which is a, um, one party that does exist in Britain. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I certainly don't think it necessarily ought to be just the three main parties. I think the... Um, the parties in the, the Celtic uh, periphery also ought to be uh, involved. The only problem with it probably is for someone like Gordon Brown, uh, all the time he's wanting to talk about substance. But of course, it's not about substance, it's about style. And you can't now separate those two things anymore, and especially in televised debates. I'm sure quite a few of the members of our audience know the answer to this question, but I'm also sure quite a few don't. How exactly is the winner chosen, the Prime Minister winner? I mean, just kind of walk us through that, how that happens. Um, in very simple terms, which is not what would this election, but in general terms, if you win enough seats to make a majority, there's, in this election there'll be 650 seats, 650 MPs returned. In the last parliament, I think it was 646. Uh, thus, you need to get more than half. Simple as that, first past the post. Um, what happens is that, that uh, he or she wins. It, it, it's fairly obvious that they, they've got the votes. Um, and then, quite literally, they uh, call up um, Buckhouse and um, go off and have a chat with she who must be obeyed. <laughs> and, um, and we're done. If that doesn't happen, then we're into the hung parliament debate. Though, though the key to it is also if you want to govern that you have to have a majority larger than all the other parties combined. So 
So it's not just a matter of being the party with the greatest number of seats. That's right. You have to have enough to be more than all the other parties if you really want to, uh, to govern. And if you don't get that, and that might be the case this time, um, you are having to negotiate with those smaller parties uh, to get back into, uh, into power. Um, that in some ways is actually another difference, I think, between the American and the English system in that you have to be leader of the party in order to become prime minister. You will never be prime minister if you had not been leader of the party during the election, uh, which means, therefore, that I think it puts a premium on experience or at least a premium on being a party leader for quite some time before you'll probably get the chance to run uh, to be prime minister. For example, Maggie Thatcher um, became leader of the party, was it 1974 or 6? I can't remember, 76? Yeah, it's a dark day. Uh, but the, the first election she fought, the first national election, was 1979. So she'd obviously had three or four years in Parliament as opposition leader before the, the election. So what you don't get is, is, by contrast, you would not get an Obama-like figure who really does not have immense, or did not have immense uh, political experience before he ran for the most senior position he could run for, the presidency. Uh, that, that would not really occur in Britain. You would know exactly the quantity you were getting, I think. I don't want to go too deep into this, but let's go back so that everybody understands precisely how this happens. Am I correct in that if everybody was here was voting in the British elections, their vote that they cast would be for their MP, their member of parliament. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. correct. They don't, there is no actual popular vote for prime minister. No. no, it's number of MPs. Okay. And so that basically means the British system, at least one thing that is kind of similar to the U.S., is that the popular vote really doesn't decide the outcome. In other words, a party could get dramatically fewer votes than another party, but mm -hmm. still win more districts and have greater representation in Parliament. Right. It's important also to understand there is a, there's a difference between Parliament and um, the government. And, and government is run by ministers. The ministers are usually the senior MPs of the winning party um, appointed by the Prime Minister, Prime being number one. So um, they are known as ministers of the Crown. They have a cabinet, just like we do here in America. Um, and they are still, as we speak today, there are no MPs. As soon as Parliament is dissolved, the MPs cease to be. They become, go back to being public, ordinary public people, um, private individuals. However, the government, the minister, ministries, are still operating. They have to, you know, we're, we're fighting a war in Afghanistan. You know, they've got to continue to do that. Uh, and the prime minister is still in charge until such time as he, he clearly can't be Prime Minister anymore or he resigns, which is probably what Brand's going to do in a few days' time. In fact, I'm not sure that um, a party has got over 50% of the national vote for the last few decades. Um, they all get in, that's right, 30, 35% of the, the vote. And in fact, they, a few weeks ago when Labour was still up there at 28, 29% of the vote predicted, um, they, could, they could come back with a majority on 28 or 29 percent, whereas the Conservatives look as if they will need a good 32, 33 percent to come back with a majority. Okay. Well, let me ask you, gentlemen, what happens, and it appears increasingly, maybe likely is the wrong word, but, but it appears you have a real possibility of a hung parliament in this case. What happens if that's the case? Meaning no one gets, what, 50% of the members of parliament, No, correct? nobody gets uh, an overall majority, uh, a majority over all the other parties. Right. Um, so they can, if, if, for example, the Conservatives, um, as I suspect they will or, uh, tomorrow, get m more MPs than anybody else, um, if they have got more MPs than every other party put together, they're in power, they can rule immediately. Gordon Brown, uh, a removal van comes to the back of 10 Downing Street tomorrow, move him out, and Cameron's moved in the same day. It's all very, very fast. None of these long transition committees and God knows what else you have in this country. 
um, before you inaugurate. Um, so it's very, very fast. But if, in fact, he did not get that overall majority of, over all the other parties, it would depend upon how many MPs he was short. If he was only a few short of an overall majority, Cameron might decide that he'll try to convince uh, some of the plied, or some of the Welsh uh, MPs, some of the Ulster Unionists in Northern Ireland, some maybe even the Scottish Nationalist uh, MPs, to agree to take the Conservative whip. And that would be sort of a construction or a building, a negotiation he would have to go through. Alternatively, he could ask Nick Clegg of the Lib Dems, would you like to join me in a con-lib parliament, in a con-lib government? And at that point, of course, negotiations would begin again between those two party leaders as to what the Lib Dems would get out of this deal, how many cabinet positions, how many ministers would they get, uh, and so on. Uh, so it really depends upon the, how, how small the majority is, or how hung it is, uh, as to what will happen next. There are a number of possible scenarios that you can, can depict. Brown, the current Prime Minister, does, the incumbent does have uh, the option to try and make it work if he he gets first choice, right. and and he can uh, he tried to do a deal with the with the Lib Dems, and we can discuss what that deal would mean if you like. But uh, in simple terms, that's what happens. Okay, in a normal uh, situation where you have a clear cut winner for prime minister, the Queen's role, as I understand it, is largely perfunctory. But in the case where you have a hung parliament, does the Queen's role change? Is it? Is she more involved in things? Not, not to my knowledge, no. I would say not. She's quite scary, though. <laughs> <laughs> she has no, I was going to say kingmaker role, she has no queenmaker role. Yes, okay, very good. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, I know that Nate Silver, a, a friend of the Dole Institute, who um, kind of made his name in the last uh, presidential election here, has actually spent quite a bit of time covering the British elections, but if anybody here wants to go home and tomorrow wants to kind of like try to follow as best they can what's going on, what, what should they be doing? Where should they be going on the web? What should they be, information should they be looking for that indicates mm -hmm. right. which way the election is going? My view would be um, go to the BBC, BBC's website. Um, you, it's being covered very comprehensively, is about to start being covered very comprehensively by CNN. Um, they're probably the only two who are going to be unbiased. Um, so if you think Fox News, Sky in the UK, it's the same thing. You may have wondered when you're listening to the radio first thing in the morning why the reports all have Scottish accents. Well, that's because they're pulling the feeds from the UK and Europe. Um, one of the things, to, interestingly, if you, if you go back, if you look at the British media, the, the print media, um, the TV uh, broadcasts have taken a lot of the power away from Murdoch, and this is the first time that that's happened, um, that, that Murdoch doesn't have as much control as, as, as he has had in the past. And people can actually see, and if Clegg won, he's never been neither side, you know, who is he? You know, Murdoch's going to be sitting in his office saying, who is this guy? I need a briefing quickly. I think that's interesting. What I think you, you need to look for above all else are what is happening to the so-called marginal seats, the ones where the majority last time was fairly slender. For whether it's Labour, Conservative or Lib Dem, it doesn't matter. But you can identify a whole slew of marginal seats which will make or break the election tomorrow. If those marginals um, start going conservative, as they will have to do, um, I think the conservatives need something like a 9% swing in the electorate uh, to get back with the majority. Um, if you see those marginals beginning to fall increasingly to the conservatives, you can begin to see that uh, a conservative government is more and more likely as the night goes on. If they are not falling to the Conservatives, but they're falling to the Lib Dems as well, then clearly a hung parliament is becoming more likely. Uh, the more that I think the Lib Dems get, the more likely a hung parliament uh, is. Uh, so it's those marginal seats. There's probably about 80, I would say, 100 constituencies that are highly marginal. That, that's where the change in this election can take place. 
The Wall Street Journal recently ran a piece talking about how, you know, among other changes like the debates, that the spouses of the candidates have been far more visible in this election. Uh, do either of you have any thoughts on that, what the traditional role has been versus kind of what role they've taken on in this election? Well, Clegg's wife doesn't want to know. It's quite interesting, really, in that, in that he's, uh, she, she, she's her own lady. She's got kids to look after. And, and she, takes, she turns up. Um, I think she's Spanish. Um, the media lover, she's very pretty, very bright. But as far as she's concerned, she's got kids to look after. And this is just, you know, this is what he does. Um, Brown's wife follows him around dutifully and looks after him and, and, and sort of ministers to him. And I don't know about Cameron's wife. I think historically, um, <clears throat> wives, or in Maggie Thatcher's case, husband, um, have not actually been at all politically uh, prominent. Um, they, they dutifully attend and so on, but I don't think there is quite the tradition of the first lady that there is in this country. Um, people are very interested who the first lady will be. Um, I don't think it really matters greatly um, uh, what they do during the election campaign, so long as they don't uh, say anything um, untoward. Um, but they are not, they, they never really get any attention, I think, by the press especially. Um, it is a little interesting, however, this time, I think, that um, Nick Clegg's wife is, I believe, Spanish. Mm. Um, and you know, their children all have very Spanish-sounding names, so there's a sort of a, a European flavour to the election, uh, rather more than a granitically British flavour. Let's, uh, I've got just a couple more questions here, and then we're going to open it up to your Q&A uh, from the audience, but uh, what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? By a process of elimination, I think you cannot see anybody other than Cameron winning tomorrow's election. Um, I cannot believe the electorate will send Gordon Brown back uh, into government. Uh, the desire for change, um, the, the dissatisfaction uh, with uh, a party that seems to have run out of ideas after 13 years, and I think it has run out of ideas at the moment. Um, the Iraq war, um, deeply unpopular in Britain, deeply unpopular. Um, for many other reasons, I cannot see Gordon Brown getting back into uh, government. The Lib Dems will do better. However, to go from 60 seats in Parliament to something like 320, which is what they would need to govern, would be a seismic political tremor, the like of which we have never seen. Uh, in British politics. So you can't imagine that the Lib Dems will ever form uh, the government unless as part of a uh, coalition. Uh, so I think by a process of elimination you're left with uh, David Cameron and I think the issue is not whether he will uh, be the winner, it's a matter of how big and whether therefore he will have to uh, form a coalition or whether he can govern alone. I think what's going to happen, my guess, is that um Brown will resign as leader of the party over the weekend. Uh, Harriet Harman, who is the deputy leader of the Labour Party, will be negotiating madly with Nick Clegg, and there will be some form of um, lab lib deal. And you're probably looking at someone like uh, Alastair Dowling, who's the current um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, runs the finances of the country. Um, becoming leader with Nick Clegg in some fairly powerful position next to him. Uh, Nick Clegg will want to negotiate things like proportional representation um, uh, um, and he also has very strong views, similar actually to President Obama's political views on, on nuclear disarmament and that sort of thing. I cannot see the... Um, I just can't see the Liberal Democrats that I know, the, 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 the sort of root and branch Liberal Democrats, wanting to get in bed with the Tories, the Conservatives. I just, I just, I just can't see it. it, it it's the, 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 the I, no, I can't see it. So I think, and because Brown, if Brown gets just enough seats, he doesn't have to resign. And the interesting thing is then he could, he could try and bluff it out uh, completely and just keep going. 
Um, it would only be if Cameron got enough seats. Brown can't do a deal. Cameron ends up being, the Queen saying to Cameron, all right, you try and do it. And he tries to go ahead and he doesn't suffer a, a, a vote of no confidence. And each time he tries to up, bring up a bill that he tries to basically get that bill voted and no one dares vote him down. Uh, because technically, although it's unheard of, if none of them can get their act together, a Queen's speech coming up on May the 20-something or other, if they can't get their act together, they go back to the country. There would be another election. It's unheard of, but it could happen. The, you, you may well be right there, but about the Lib Dems not wanting to climb into bed with the Conservatives. But on the other side, I really can't see them um, keeping Labour in power. I think that would be the kiss of death for the Lib Dems if they kept Labour in power by negotiating a deal. It's an, it's an interesting... I think Labour in many ways is close. See, Cameron is a, a devout Eurosceptic. Hates Europe, doesn't want to know. Um, that we know. And um, whereas, you know, I've had conversations with leaders of parties sitting in cars waiting to come into somewhere like this and we've been 20 minutes early so we've been sitting in the car park around the corner you know, talking about the what ifs and John Major when he was Prime Minister made it very clear that, that we would have probably, Britain would have probably joined um, gone into Europe if we hadn't had the punch up over what we're going to call the currency it's as simple as that, that was John Major's opinion that, that if we'd been able to call, instead of, you know, we'd have, the currency was called the euro, but in France it would be called the franc, and in England it would be called the pound, and he, he reckoned personally it was as simple as that. You see, I think these things are very deep. I, I can see the Lib Dems working with Labour, not with Brown, but with maybe other Labour uh, leaders. But the Lib Dems have come out to say that at the next European... Um, agreement, they will put a referendum to the population, not upon the agreement, but as to whether or not we will stay in Europe. So they're not so far away from the Conservatives, if that is what they're advocating. Their, their view has always been that um, we go into, it, it, the Liberal Democrats, if we go into Europe, we've got, you know, we don't have the problems with Greece and Portugal and so on, that the financial situation has to be one that is okay and with everybody before we go in, we don't go in before that, and that there should be a referendum in the country. At the risk of uh, oversimplification, is it fair to say, Victor, that view it, your view is that Cameron will either win a majority or will come close yeah. and will most likely form some co sort of coalition? And Jeremy, you're saying that Cameron will either win it outright, but that if he comes close, his goose is effectively cooked. Oh, you could say that, yeah. There's an old English saying, political I... saying, you may think that I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> uh, it's a difficult one. Nobody knows, actually, right now. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I think on the whole, my, my view is exactly as you say. I think, uh, I think the Conservatives are in power by the end of tomorrow. Okay. Interestingly, bookmakers, which you don't have here, but the betting on it is there is $37 million right now riding on this election. You might be interested to know. And a hung parliament is going to cost the leading bookmakers something like 250 million. You know, they, 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 they can't deal with it. it they, they, they exist. <laughs> okay. Well, this, this is absolutely fascinating to me. We're going to open it up to Q&A. If you would raise your hand and wait for the cordless mic to get to you so everyone can hear your question. We have a lady over here. Wait for the cordless mic, please. No, you actually can't because we need to get this on tape for our website. Okay. Uh, is it on now? I would like an, a deeper explanation of proportional representation, which has been discussed in the, in the media that I've watched. Can you explain that to me? Because it seems to me the Lib Dems are calling for it primarily, but Cameron gave some response to it. So what does that mean? What's that change? That, I think Jeremy can do a whole better job on this than I can. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> but I, I mean, in the way that, at the moment, 
you can win in a constituency with the majority of voters voting against you. The other parties can have more voters for them than the one who actually wins because of the first past the post. I, all you have to do is get more votes than everybody else. But everybody else might collectively have more votes than what, than what you have. So that is the, the first past the post system we have at the moment, which is why it leads, I think, on the whole uh, to dissatisfaction, and especially amongst those people who are third parties, like the Lib Dems. They often come out, they end the, the election um, having got 20, 22% of the national vote, and they have 40 seats. So it seems highly unfair, as the system we now have. PR would, would seek to alter that. Now, there are so many different PR systems, um, I'm not sure which one we would go for. But in effect, the votes that were going to other parties would be redistributed, as I understand it, um, rather more equitably. But I, I, it depends on what system you're using. Interestingly, two, two points here. One, um, we actually have a real expert on the subject sit, sitting in the front row here. Um, probably knows more about it than anybody else I know for thousands of miles. Uh, and she will go on for hours and hours and hours and <laughs> hours and hours about it. The long and the short of it is that you will know that there is also, over and above the British Parliament and the House of Lords, we have a Scottish Parliament, a Welsh Assembly, and a Northern Ireland Assembly. Been, um, and they are elected using PR. Uh, and interestingly, we've all heard about the punch-ups in Northern Ireland, where my wife and I have spent a considerable amount of time. Um, to give you an example, even today in Northern Ireland, you would have armed security at the doors here and there and here, all over the place. And these are guys who will use their weapons. It's very serious. You don't mess about with them. And the reason that they do PR is because it was deemed to be the, the fairest way of um, an election, of carrying out an election. And interestingly, the Americans are going in that route. You didn't know that, did you? The election, the Americans are going towards PR right now. If you don't believe me, look at how the Oscars, look at the Oscars. That is a very good example of PR. If you want to know how it works, look at how the Oscars, you know, you vote for him, but if he doesn't get it, this is the one you'd really prefer. It, it, it's complicated and you can't try and do it in an explanation in, in 30 seconds. Okay, next question, right here. Um, in the recent European parliamentary elections in 2009, we see the British National Party and UKIP sizably increase their stay in British politics, notably now with UKIP under Lord Pierce of Rannick claiming to try to establish a kingmaker position. What do you think the likelihoods are that these two more fringe right political parties will actually make it into parliament within this cycle? And will they have a chance to be kingmaker, especially UKIP? Uh, as far as I'm aware, I think UKIP had one member of parliament in the last party, in the last um, parliament. Um, you have to understand that, that UKIP is, vi is viewed by most Brits as a sort of slightly liberal version of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, they're not liked. Um, these are people who would have been in the black shirts during the last war. Um, and um, the, the, I think yesterday, because I get my timing out, but yesterday um, UKIP have been involved in a mailing going around mm. in East London saying um, to everyone with a foreign sounding name, such as Patel, saying, um, dear Mr. Patel or Mrs. Patel, don't worry if we get elected, we won't come after you. This is something that's being put around by the other parties. And if you're Mr. and Mrs. Patel and you get that letter, what are you going to think? And they're saying, of course, nothing to do with us. We didn't do that. Oh, no, sorry. I think the answer really is that they might increase their uh, number of MPs slightly by one or by two um, in both cases, um, but not sufficiently to make any difference in the context of a hung parliament. And more to the point, I don't think either the Conservatives or Labour would uh, touch them with a barge pole. So I don't think they will even begin to negotiate with them to bring them in uh, to anything. So I think their, their impact on the election is likely to be nil, I think. 
So that we have a better context for this gentleman, did, did, did one of you say there are 650, is that right, members of parliament? Yeah. Roughly how many of those seats uh, until the dissolution of the government were held by parties other than the three big parties vying for this election? Um, is it 30 or 40? I, something uh, like well, I, I have a number. Labor had 345, the Conservatives 193, Liberals, Lib Dems 63. Here's a good example. The Liberal Democrats are not the Liberal Party, so you would see on the TV um, the, the, the media, the, sorry, the other leaders going, and the Liberal Party which have about no MPs at all. Scottish Nationals, eight. Sinn Féin have five. And of course, Sinn Féin from Northern Ireland, their members uh, are not actually members. They have the seats, but they never actually go because they're not prepared to swear allegiance to the Queen. And so if you want to do the math, you can do the math. Uh, you know, uh, They come from England, uh, returns 530, Wales 40, Scotland 59, and Northern Ireland 18 MPs. So you can actually be a member of Parliament, say, in Northern Ireland, a member of Parliament, and a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. If, if the Tories get short of 50% plus one, but they get very close to 50%, are there any of these smaller parties that they would likely try to align themselves with, yeah, rather could, than the Lib Dems? Yes, for the same reason here, in fact, is it, we don't have such a thing as filibustering. But let's just say we did. Um, the, the, the people who win are clearly going to be nice to a couple of other people just in case someone wakes up dead one morning. The, it depends which party you're talking about. Um, the Conservatives would, I think, typically be um, willing to affiliate with the Ulster Unionists because historically they have been the Conservative and the Unionist Party. And therefore, the Protestant uh, MPs from Northern Ireland um, would, I think, be the natural bedfellow for the Conservatives. Um, Labour, uh, it, it's more likely that um, Plaid Cymru, the Scottish Nationalists, might agree, uh, but only might, uh, to, to try to keep Labour in power. Okay. Other questions? Kathleen, our expert on the systems, is going to ask a question. If it's a question on proportional representation, I'm not going to answer it. It's not about PR. <laughs> uh, this is a, co a comment about the actual elections uh, and the money spent on them. Ooh, it would yes. be amazing if, uh, to, to see a, a candidate here for a legislature, a state legislature, say, being restricted to the amount of money that MPs are allowed to spend. It's incredibly small. Yet they, they are not allowed to spend much money, which is why there is so much foot soldiering going on. And the election night, or the election day night, is absolutely exciting. It's really great, because they're still doing paper ballots, and they all have to be counted by hand. And all the ballots come to a big room, twice the size of this, with tables all over and, and civil servants out counting. As, I just wondered if you might like to describe the, the election procedures as they differ from here. Well, you may be interested to know, because I did the math for this. I didn't, I didn't know that she was going to ask that question, but whatever. For a town, let's call Lawrence a town for a moment, a town like Lawrence, a candidate is going to be able to spend, and I've translated into dollars, about $18,000 on the campaign, on a four-week short campaign, as it's known. That's it. We're done. So if you think of, you know, um, a representative or a senator, you know, the representatives are out there trying to get up into the millions of dollars. 18 grand. That's, that's pretty exactly what it is. Give or take $500. Um, and as I say, any more, then you're in serious trouble. Of course, also, you don't have to raise any of this money. So there are no fundraising dinners, yeah, point. events. Um, you get the electoral expenses. It allows you to do a few posters, a few flyers at best. Um, so it's fairly low key, I think you could say, uh, uh, most of the constituency elections. And also, you're not um, allowed to do any television advertising. So you're, you're spared that god-awful thing every night of the election. On let, the me, TV. let me and let me follow up on that to ask you both a question. Is, is a lot of money spent 
on behalf of the ticket, the national party, as opposed to simply just the candidates? Isn't that really the thrust of it because the system is... The Liberal Democrats will probably be spending, I, I don't know, when I, I was involved a number of millions of pounds to, I'm not even sure if it was two million, uh, you know, in total. Um, the Conservatives have access to fours or fives of millions and that's for the whole national campaign. It's not, really isn't very much money, you know, and it's usually coming from, from wealthy donors. Okay, let me do one more follow up, then we get another question from the audience. Um, people are gonna, people are voting not for the, when people go into the ballot box here, they're gonna vote mainly for the party, but they're also going to look at the two individuals. In Britain, aren't they mostly saying, I'm going to vote for the Tory, and the Tory happens to, or the, the Lib Dem, and the Lib Dem happens to be Jeremy Taylor? I think I would have said absolutely yes to that uh, for most of last century. I think party loyalty and party affiliation was very important. I actually see a sort of change beginning at the moment, in part because... MPs have become like glorified social workers in the sense that they hold their clinics at the weekend, they try to solve the problems that individual constituents have, and I think there's a, a fairly high level of gratitude when they do actually solve problems in this way, uh, whatever it may be about water or gas mains or whatever. Um, as a result of that, I think there's a, a greater incumbency effect within British politics than there used to be. I think people are individually liked, in a sense. Now, the, the entire expenses scandal aside, which has obviously put a lot of uh, uh, these people into an odium which they've not had uh, before, but I think there is a sort of um, incumbency effect this time round. I think people probably will be willing to keep some people in office uh, or, or, or uh, in, in the House of Commons, and they will vote for them, even though it's not their party loyalty that they're voting for. It's rather like saying, um, let's think about um, where the Dole Institute, Senator Dole, um, he happens to be, let's say, in this conversation, the local guy. Well, you're not going to fire him. It's just not going to happen because he's much loved and he, you know, when you have a problem with, you, with the IRS or with the social services or whatever it is, he'll pick up the phone and, and he'll sort it out. And he says, hello, my name's Dull. And they listen <laughs> and he fixes it. Um, and someone like me coming along, let's say, I may be, you know, whizzy, bang and terrific and everything else, but I'm not going to push the incumbent out. That's why people like Paisley and co in Northern Ireland are, are still there, because they're not going to get thrown out. Um, in the seat that perhaps I would have been sitting in, um, the MP, the previous MP, previous but one MP was, was much, much loved, was killed in a car accident. And then another pal of mine, perhaps had the same name as mine, worked for him, he became the MP um, and was the MP for a long, long time. Now we have a lady standing who actually not many people know and she could lose it to the Conservatives because she's not local, she's not, you know, it's not that she's not a nice person or anything, she's just not locally loved. She hasn't been out there fixing, you know, the things that need fixing. You know, and the local MP Again, in a town like Lawrence, you know, when, when there's holes in the, in the roads, he or she will be out there with their car, standing there, waiting for a TV crew to turn up, driving the police crazy because you can't arrest an MP, you know, and that's what local people want. There, there could also be tactical voting, and it's thought there might be a little bit more tactical voting this time round. I mean, for example, if you're a Labour supporter and you've loyally supported Labour all the years, you know they're not going to get back in power, or you presume they're not, uh, but you don't want the Conservatives back, you vote Lib Dem. Uh, that kind of tactical voting often changes party loyalties as well. Okay, thank you. We had a question over here. Entry. Uh, we have politicians who earn really good salaries, get really good health care, better than just the standard Medicare, and they also get really good retirement. What kind of perks do your MPs get in the way of salaries, health care, retirement? Anything different from the regular person on the street? 
they just fiddle their expenses. <laughs> MPs, MPs are currently earning, the salary for an MP is currently in dollars, $96,000 a year, uh, plus expenses. So they, they get a, uh, expenses to run an office in London at Westminster and an office back in their constituency. Um, they are allowed to claim things for housing and, and as he says, the, there's, there's been a lot of problems with, with expenses uh, and people claiming stuff that they shouldn't have claimed and then there's a lot of other parties stirring it up, you know. Um, I'll give you a good example. A close friend of mine got thrown into this because he has an apartment which which fairly close to, to Westminster um, and the media were getting all worked up about this with other people and they suddenly realised that his daughter lived at the apartment. So dad is there during the week and then he goes back to the constituency at the weekend and his daughter, who I've known since she was about that big, he's now living at the apartment and going to university and they were saying this wasn't right and so, you know, is it right, is it not right? Most of the people in the room would do the same thing as Andrew, but, you know, the expenses thing there was a... Some of the MPs, yeah, they shouldn't be MPs anymore and they've been fired. They're not going to be allowed to stand again. But the actual, they're actually earning pretty much exactly $96,000 a year. We have a question back in the back. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming over here. We do appreciate it very much. Um, my question to both of you was regarding a, uh, a political ad that was run in the 2008 American presidential election. The artist's name was Shepard Ferry. Uh, you've more than likely seen their ads before uh, featuring uh, now President Obama. Uh, slogans such as hope, change, things like that. The red and, the red and blue contrasting uh, features of the uh, Art itself are pretty well known. I think everybody, almost everybody in the world's probably seen them now. Um, even people who read Dredge Report. Uh, however, um, I'm wondering, do you, seeing this image or this style of imagery coming up in the British elections, I believe it was regarding uh, uh, Clegg, do you see this as possibly, uh, although you highlighted the numerous differences between our election cycles uh, in both respective countries, do you still not, in fact, see possibly some kind of uh, not infiltration, that'd be the wrong word, but some kind of influence of American politics on this British electoral cycle? Yeah, um, there is absolutely no doubt, and you just need to trust me on this, that um, Nick Clegg's uh, media advisors um, have been looking very closely at what and how President Obama did what he did. And... Um, and the other guys haven't got that yet. Though I think also Nick Clegg has been looking at um, the experience of hung parliaments uh, for which he's gone to Europe uh, for examples of that to see how you negotiate if there is a hung parliament. Uh, but the influence of America is not really, I think, just in this election alone. I think we've seen it over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, in fact. Um, Tony Blair was... Uh, uh, deeply influenced by um, Bill Clinton and the techniques and manner of campaigning that, that he did. And they brought them across to, to talk to the, uh, the new Labour people uh, before the uh, 1997 election. So I think American influence goes back actually quite a few years now. You may be, if I can just add to this, um, I won't do a show of hands, but who here used to watch West Wing? Um, and. Um, when they were going to do the second series on West Wing, which is, comes out on what's known as Channel 4 in the UK, um, they were going to bring over Alison Janney and I think Toby were coming across to, um, you know, to promote it. So they're flying first class, of course. Um, the aeroplane lands at Heathrow or Gatwick. And those of us who've been on these aeroplanes, you land, you're told, don't move, stay in your seats till... And would... Miss Janney and Mr. So-and-so, please report to when you get off. And so they're expecting to be carted off to Channel 4. Um, and um, what actually happened was that there was a government car sitting there waiting for them, and they were whisked off to, um, to Number 10, where the press office, who had heard that they were coming over, 
were absolutely determined that they were going to see them first. And when, and Alice and Janice says when, when um, they turned up, when they actually got in there, you go through all the security and the gates and what have you, there's this great big picture, a West Wing picture, that was up on the wall. And all they wanted them to do was to sign it. <laughs> because this is, that's what gave, gives the impression of American politics. And the closest thing that you can ever, there's, there's been nothing like West Wing in UK. The nearest thing was a, was a, a farce called um, Yes, Yes Minister, um, which some of you will have heard of, um, which actually gave a very accurate portrait of what politics in the UK were like in the 80s. Um, but I think that, it, that watching Clegg particularly, you get a good idea of how, as you, your specific question is, how it's changing to, to you know, the next time round. Um, you're going to see a Labour leader doing a Clegg. Another question right here, Scotty. Uh, I want you to please correct my impressions here because they're probably wrong. But as I understand it, when the Prime Minister is declared, whoever that is, then he goes to the monarch, which is now the Queen, to be accepted. And I wondered in not being an expert on British history, if there has ever been an instance where the monarch has influenced who the prime minister is. History, it depends. comes under your department. <laughs> it depends how far you go back. Um, I think the last, the last monarch who thought she could, and certainly thought, wanted to do, uh, would be Queen Victoria. Um, she, I think, however, past the 1840s or 1850s, she was not essentially influencing anything, uh, though she might have thought she was. Um, for example, she hated Gladstone with a passion, the great uh, leader of the Liberal Party, and she loved Benjamin Disraeli, the leader of the Conservatives. Uh, but it didn't matter what she liked or who she liked or disliked. Uh, it was the election that was uh, determining who would be Prime Minister. And therefore, since Queen Victoria, we've never had a monarch who, in my experience or view, has influenced um, who becomes Prime Minister. They might have their own personal thoughts about it. Um, I don't think Queen Elizabeth II um, liked Margaret Thatcher, especially. Um, I think she felt that Margaret Thatcher um, talked to her like a public meeting, hectored her, um, and by contrast, she liked uh, other, she liked Blair, I think, on the whole, because they had more of a chat and so on. Uh, but I don't think any monarch has influenced any uh, prime minister, not since Victoria. Important to point out also that the, what actually happens is that civil servants inform the Queen that so-and-so has got enough votes to form a, 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 um, a government. And, and so-and-so, Cameron, let's say, sits in his office waiting for a telephone call to be invited to come to the palace. He doesn't call the Queen and say, have you got five minutes? You know, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> and interestingly, and I think this is a thing still about British politics, is it doesn't matter who you are, you wait until she calls. Uh, we, we English get a bit funny often, or certainly I do, about the royalty. I haven't got a lot of time for them, frankly, but don't touch them because they're our royalty. And so the Queen will, will, would meet Mr. Cameron and she'd invite him in and he'll have to do a lot of bowing and shuffling which he won't like much and, and he'll come in and she'll have a little chat with him and she'll put her handbag down and she'll invite him to form a government, her government. And then he goes away and he, he gets his cabinet ministers and forms a cabinet. And as you're probably aware, this, this so-called Queen's speech when she talks about what my government will be doing in the next uh, few years, the next year or so, that speech is given to her by the party that is in power. She doesn't write it herself, obviously. She just simply uh, speaks it. I have time for one or two more questions right back here, and then we'll get one more here, and I think that'll probably be it. You mentioned the, the very modest cap on campaign funding and also the very short campaign durations. Uh, would it be proper to, as a first question, would it be proper to, uh, to say that those are related and reinforcing? And then also, what exactly, what sort of threshold has to be met before someone can receive 
because uh, it sounds like it's public money that's funding these campaigns, right? So what threshold does someone have to meet in order to be funded? Okay, um, I'll try and do this very quickly, okay? Uh, if you want to stand as an MP for Labour or the Liberal Democrats, and I can't speak for the Tories, what happens is you go through an approval process where you basically pass an exam. Are you going to be able to be an MP? Uh, answer, tick, yes, done that, okay? You then get uh, selected by your constituency uh, to become a PPC, prospective parliamentary candidate, okay? Um, and then parliament gets dissolved. Uh, at that point, you become a candidate, right? You have to pay a deposit to the local authority, which is currently £500, $750, okay? And if you don't get 5% of the popular vote, you lose that. It is known also as losing your deposit. So-and-so did so badly, they lost their deposit. So if Labour or the Conservatives all come to that Lib Dems or other people, put up a candidate, they never want them to be doing so badly that, that, that they're going to lose their, lose their deposit. I didn't quite catch the first part of your question. You, you were talking about capped expenses. You mentioned like 18 grand is about what a campaign spend. Right. I, th I think you're actually making, is there a connection between the uh, low funding of the election and the brevity of the campaign? Yes. Um, I'd, it's an interesting possibility is that, but I, I'm not sure that is the reason why the uh, campaigns are so brief. Um, I think you have to recognize that during an election campaign, Britain in effect has no government. Unlike here when there's a presidential race, the, the, the sitting president is still in power, Congress is still working during that two-year period. Um, during, the, <laughs> during the three to four weeks of our election campaigns, there is basically no government in power. So you would not want there to be that vacuum for very long. That, I think, explains the brevity of the campaign. I think we actually have two more questions here, so let's get this gentleman first, and then we get this gentleman right here in front of him last, and that'll be our last question. Uh, we seem to be coming to the end of 13 years of labor government. Um, it doesn't seem that there's a big decisive turn here, however. What, what do you see? Well, I didn't quite catch what you said right at the end. Um, do you think we'll see a decisive turn from this 13 years, or will it be more fuzzy? Mm -hmm. the, the, the one thing that any new government will have to face is the enormous public debt. Um, I, I'm not sure I know the full figure of how many billion dollars that the debt is in Britain, um, but as a percentage of GDP, it's about 11 or 12 percent, uh, not actually that dissimilar to that of Greece. And we know what, what's occurring in Greece at the moment. Uh, so the, the thing they will have to tackle almost immediately, whoever gets back into power, uh, is the enormous debt, and they will have to find ways of bringing public expenditure down or increasing taxation. They're the only main two choices they've got. Um, at the moment, David Cameron of the Conservatives says he'll do a tax cut and yet still bring the deficit down. I don't see how you, you do that. Well, at least you don't do it without even more enormous cuts to public expenditure. Uh, so I think, in a sense, the welfare state... Uh, and it's a large one. Um, it has increased during that 13 years of labor. Um, that is, I think, on the chopping block uh, in the next uh, four to five years. Um, but that is the, the issue that n no government is, is now able to avoid. Uh, that, that, that's not a change, though, I don't think. Um, labor has been trying to grapple with that already. The governor of the Bank of England said the other day that whoever does become the next prime minister is... Uh, is it's a poison chalice, two years, end of career. That's what he reckons. And, and um, I suspect that, that this might be why the Lib Dems and Labour would work well together, because they would have enough clout without, in, within the country to do the policies, and their policies are actually thought out. I mean, in the Lib Dems' case, just for example, um, the financial policies are thought out by accountants. 
before we live in America now, so we have an American accountant, but previously our accountant in the UK was one of those accountants. They're CPAs who do it, and they justify it, and, and Labour do the same sort of thing. It's whether or not you can get it through that the idea is. I, and I think to follow up on that, if we can go back, and I ask you both to put this in a little bit of context. Jeremy, you said before that there are how many Labour MPs as, uh, and up to dissolution of the government? Um, 380. 300 and some on. Yeah. Okay. 300 and some on. Okay. So, but it's a majority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're clearly going to be nowhere close to the majority after this election. Right. Okay. So that would be the kind of the power shift. One more question right here. And then that's going to be it. How does this election, if it does, affect the House of Lords? As you're, I'm sure, aware, Labour in this 13-year period has sought to reform the House of Lords and it has kicked out um, all of the hereditary uh, peers, or most of them at least. I'm not sure. Are there any left in the House of Lords? Hereditary no, peers? unfortunately. No, good, good, good. <laughs> I'm, I'm very pleased they've gone, but... Um, and instead, of course, it's the, the, the parties and the government now who, will, who send people uh, to the House of Lords, though they're not elected. So it's not an elected second chamber. Um, that is a possibility, I think, within the space of, of an ex-parliament that we could see an elected uh, second chamber. Um, that would be, for instance, if Nick Clegg joins in with Labour, that would be one of the things that they, they would like to see in general terms, the party... And you've got to understand the party and the people running the party aren't necessarily always the same thing, you know. It, it, but the party would like to see things like that. I was involved um, when, when this all went through in the late 90s as to who's going to be a lord and who isn't and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, and, and trying to put the lists up to, to Prime Minister Blair, uh, you know, for recommendation onto the Queen and that sort of thing. And... and taking out families who have been in, in the House of Lords sitting, it's called sitting, uh, um, for generations, and all of a sudden they can't do it anymore. Jeremy, Victor, thank you so much for an outstanding discussion.